It's really a pleasure to be able to talk about um, some of our recent work uh, from just this past year. I'll focus mostly on um, the work describing uh, organoids to model um, choroid plexus, which I will describe in more detail in a moment. But before I sort of get into that and, and the way we've also used that to look at uh, COVID-19 a little bit, um, I would like to first sort of set the stage and talk about kind of, you know, why we need these, these types of in vitro models. So, um, you know, our brains are hugely complex, of course, we, they're, they're greatly increased in size, but also, you know, the way these neurons are connecting up with each other um, is much more complex in the human brain than, you know, for example, in rodents. And so we are interested in these sorts of human specific processes that, are, um, that, that set up uh, our brains differently during development. And um, this is not just an interest, you know, for the sake of, of curiosity, but also um, because a better understanding of human brain development and function, I think, is, is desperately needed um, in order to start to better understand uh, disorders that affect the brain. And I think probably mental health, um, mental illness in particular, is an area of, of neuroscience that that is um, sadly, you know, lacking in terms of new treatments. Um, and so these are, um, what I'm showing you here are UK numbers, um, but very similar to the kinds of numbers that you see in the, in the United States as well, um, that around one in four people will actually experience a mental illness every single year. So it's really quite a large number of people. Um, but unfortunately, um, the area of, of mental health research is receiving a fraction of the funding that um, cancer research receives. And I think one of the biggest reasons for that is because unfortunately, um, mental health research has, has failed um, in a lot of ways. Um, and that's um, also kind of described in, in some of the literature as what's known as the clinical trial cliff, which um, talks about this, you know, the, these various drugs and treatments that have been um, developed in preclinical models, for example, in mice or in, you know, more traditional um, in vitro systems. Uh, but then when these drugs reach the clinic, so the, you know, clinical trial stage, they unfortunately fail quite miserably, much worse than um, any other therapeutic area. Um, and so a lot of, this has led a, a lot of um, pharmaceutical companies to actually pull out of neuroscience entirely. And obviously if they're not involved, um, we're not getting any new drugs. And I think the, the, the uh, mismatch between the preclinical and the critical the clinical is really the problem here. And um, I guess one, you know, one of the biggest reasons uh, uh, in, in my view, and I think many others is that uh, because our brain is so unique, uh, it's difficult to model it in more traditional animal models. So um, that's where sort of these in vitro models come from. Um, but um, I think before I sort of talk about the in vitro models, I need to explain the, the key stages during development that we need to try to model in order to end up with a, a, a more um, realistic in vitro model. So um, the human brain, um, like that of you know, all vertebrates, um, starts out as a neural tube here, which you can see these are sagittal sections of developing human brain over time. And you can see that, um, uh, you know, it's an epithelium and like all epithelia, it has a fluid filled um, lumen on the inside and it's surrounded by epithelial cells. And these neuroepithelial cells um, expand, but particularly the, the cells here at the more anterior portion of this neural tube uh, really balloon out in humans. Uh, and this is, of course, the, the, the developing cerebral cortex, which is so greatly expanded in humans. And so if you um, look at the wall of this cerebral cortex, you can, this developing cerebral cortex, you can see it's made up of these neural stem cells, these neuroepithelial cells initially that are dividing symmetrically and then become radial glia and produce um, other more differentiated cell types, including neurons. And then these neurons, of course, position themselves in their proper locations within the cortical wall. And this will then give rise to the um, functional connectome. 
And what I want to stress here, really, because I, I won't get into too much of this, um, but what I really want to stress is that this functioning connectome, um, you know, the functioning brain really does depend heavily on all of the um, uh, precursor events that lead up to it. So proper connectivity will only come if neurons are properly positioned. Neurons will only be properly positioned if you've got a proper scaffold here, so the proper sort of cytoarchitecture that you see here. And you will only get that if you have proper early tissue architecture. So all this, this all comes back to this structure-function relationship and how important it is that you have proper tissue structure. And then another thing I just want to um, point out, which is directly relevant for what I will talk about today, is this this big blob of stuff in the inside of the ventricle, which most people totally ignore, but is actually very, very important. And this is what's called the choroid plexus. And this is what will generate the cerebral spinal fluid inside of these ventricles. Um, okay, so if we wanna try to model these events, and like I say, model tissue architecture as close as possible, we need to, again, learn from development. And so I actually have to take you even further back in development to, to describe um, the method, um, basically to the very beginning. So um, of course, a fertilized egg will, will form the early embryo, the blastocyst, and the um, inner cell mass of the blastocyst is what will give rise to the embryo, as many of you know. And through a series of morphogenetic movements and fate choices, um, these pluripotent cells will generate the three germ layers, the uh, endoderm on the inside, the mesoderm in between, and the ectoderm on the outside. And the midline of the ectoderm will actually fold up and close and form the neural tube. So if we want to understand or model um, developing human brain tissue, we need to try to uh, recapitulate these processes as closely as possible. And the idea when I was a postdoc, um, obviously, I, I mean, I don't have time to get into it, but this is, of course, um, you know, a method <clears throat> that is, is standing on the, on the shoulders of giants. There's a, a whole huge foundation of research, especially from uh, the likes of Yoshiki Sasai, for example, who's done extensive work on, on first just understanding the key developmental stages and events going on, and then applying that to stem cells. And so, of course, our work is, is really building upon uh, that work, um, as well as, you know, work of others in the organoid field, um, Hans Klavers, of course, being key there, um, and, and others in, in the um, you know, neural differentiation field, Lawrence Studer, for example, Pierre van der Hagen. So I, I just want to make sure that, you know, this is, this is work that is a real team effort. I think many of us has been, have been working together to try to do this. Um, and so when I started working on this, um, my thought was as a developmental biologist, um, you know, this happens normally in an embryo without too much exogenous guidance, you know? There's not really much actually coming from the mother, for example, that's, that's, um, that is uh, leading to these events. These cells, these inner cell mass cells, they already sort of, if you will, know what to do. So um, the idea here is to kind of take more of a hands-off approach and try to nurture these cells to do what they're already programmed to do. And so that's what this protocol really is. Um, and that's what kind of also sets it apart from some of the other protocols out there. So um, in this, essentially what we're doing is, um, you know, it's been shown for a long time that pluripotent stem cells, so these can be embryonic stem cells, which are actually cells taken from the inner cell mass of a blastocyst, or they can be induced pluripotent stem cells, which are coming from uh, reprogramming um, using, for example, the Yamanaka factors. Um, regardless of what you start with, these pluripotent stem cells, um, they have it in them to uh, undergo these um, fate decisions and morphogenetic events that you see in an embryo. And they will do this in what's called an embryoid body. And this has been shown for decades now. I think we're at that point. Um, and so the idea here is to similarly start with these kinds of embryoid bodies. But now the idea is not to necessarily drive them towards a neural identity but rather to uh, prevent the growth of non-neural tissues. And so what we do is we take these tissues and put them in a very minimal media, 
which lacks some of the growth factors and, and other, I mean, particularly serum that's required for growth of these other germ layers. And we're end up, we end up with very nice um, neural ectodermal tissues because really the neural ectoderm is really the only tissue that, that will really grow and expand in this type of minimal media. Um, but you can't leave it on for too long because they'll also die if you leave it in that for too long. So the timing is really key. But once you have these nice tissues, then we can place them in a droplet of Matrigel. And this is where um, uh, this has been heavily influenced by Hans Klavers. And these neural ectodermal tissues, which because they're epithelial, as I mentioned, just like, for example, intestinal organoids, they will respond to the matrigel in the same way as other epithelia, and they will form these um, lumen, the, these epithelial buds with lumens, just like um, neural tube-like uh, structures. And then with um, the other sort of, um, I guess, major jump here as well was the realization that um, these tissues could grow quite large if we introduce agitation. So by either culturing them in a spinning bioreactor or on an orbital shaker, just basically to get better nutrient and oxygen supply through this sort of media movement around the organoids. So um, the initial, of course, because this is all very intrinsic patterning, it's um, unpredictable. So you can end up with lots of different brain regions. You also don't always just get neural, depending, like I say, this timing of this um, minimal media, this neural, neural minimal media, is really key and if you don't get the timing right you sometimes get other regions other you know mesodermal for example so um, another um, direction we've been going in is trying to um, improve the reproducibility again without directing still in it, you know allowing these tissues to, to um, develop according to their own intrinsic uh, developmental programs but with a, a couple of little tricks which I won't really get into because this is published um, we are now able to, to get much more reproducible neural induction. And just uh, by getting more reproducible neural induction, we also get more reproducible formation of particularly the telencephalon, which is the region of the brain that includes the cerebral cortex, as well as the choroid plexus, which I'll talk about in a moment, but also the what are called the ganglionic eminences that give rise to inhibitory neurons. And so these organoids then have these large sort of outgrowths and um, we've injected a blue dye here, so you can see these fluid-filled um, cavities on the inside of some of these. Um, and so essentially what you're looking at is each one of these kind of lobes is a developing cerebral cortical tissue. So you can see that a little bit better here where we've sectioned through it. You can see how large each one of these lobes can get. And so the way we kind of analyze these is by looking at each lobe um, as a unit, as an, a, a cerebral cortex. And if you compare with um, actual developing cortex, for example, from a mouse embryo, I hope you can see the similar sort of architecture here with these fluid-filled um, ventricle-like cavities and the surrounding cortical tissue. And actually then if you zoom in on the wall of these tissues, you can also see the, the similar sort of cytoarchitecture with a ventricular zone, a subventricular zone, an intermediate zone, and a cortical plate, just like in vivo. So this has been our goal to try to mimic the tissue architecture as closely as possible so that we can end up with a more realistic model. So um, another uh, aspect we've been working a lot on is um, to try to improve the longer term um, maturation of these tissues, because over time in 3D, these tissues begin to um, undergo necrosis because they simply just don't have vasculature. Uh, and um, you know, agitation will only go so far. It's fine for these earlier stages that I just showed you, but actually if I just go back one, I can, it's, it's fine for these stages where you've got diffusion of nutrients from both the outside and from these inside fluid filled cavities. But as more and more neurons are being produced and this cortical plate gets thicker and thicker, the tissue does start to suffer from a lack of vascularization. And particularly neurons are very sensitive to this because they're, these existing neurons begin to get pushed in more and more as new neurons come in and replace them in the surface. And so to overcome that, we've been taking these tissues at about this time point here where you can see these nice lobes. They have a very nice structure. There's no necrosis within the lobes yet. You see this necrosis in the center, but we don't care about that because we're focusing on these cerebral cortical tissues here. 
So we take them out of this time point when they're still very healthy and we do slice cultures. So very similar to what I used to do in Joe's lab, organotypic slice cultures, and we are able to keep them like that for many months. And um, what you're looking at here is one-year-old um, organoids grown like this, where you can see these really beautiful, complex dendritic architecture. So this is an earlier stage where you see a much more simplified architecture, but over time they become very, very mature and you see very nice mature dendritic spines and you see very nice survival of neurons with a proper um, dense neuropill being maintained as opposed to these whole 3D organoids, which you begin to see quite a lot of, of cell death and the neuropill is breaking down. And so what's very interesting about this as well is that we get these really long range um, axon bundles coming out. And you can see these, these converging and, and merging to form large tract-like structures. And indeed, um, we've also you know, done some examination of what different types of neurons are present, and we're able to see that some of these tracts can actually um, project out and innervate other tissues. Here we've got a mouse spinal cord with a bit of muscle, and we can actually get functional innervation. Here we're um, stimulating the human organoid and then looking at the mouse muscle tissue. So um, I want to move to what you actually invited me to talk about here today, which is um, the recent work that we published last year on choroid plexus organoids. And then I also want to talk about how we're using those along with these more um, uh, neural telencephalic organoids to look at SARS-CoV-2 uh, tropism and entry. OK, so for the first part, so like I say, a lot of people uh, have kind of overlooked the choroid plexus, um, thinking it's just sort of sitting in there, you know, doing a housekeeping job, but it's a very important housekeeping job. Um, so large amounts of CSF are actually being produced every day in the human brain. So around 600 mils produced each day. So this tissue is highly secretory. It's both um, filtering the blood to generate that fluid and secreting a lot of proteins, um, sort of de novo, you know, into the CSF. And there's quite a number of nutrients that are provided by the CSF and not necessarily by the blood. And there's also, it's also playing a very important role in efflux of certain waste byproducts. Um, so for example, there's evidence that it's involved in clearing out um, aggregation prone proteins like amyloid beta. So it's very important for normal function. It's also part of the broader blood CNS barrier. So the barrier that protects the entire brain. The blood CNS barrier has been known about for a long time. It was discovered you know, way back in the beginning of the last century that, if you, that even in an embryo, actually, there's already a barrier. And if you inject a blue dye, for example, systemically, it won't enter into the brain. And there's been a lot of focus on the blood-brain barrier in this context. So the blood-brain barrier specifically is one of the barriers within the blood CNS barrier that is the barrier surrounding the blood vessels that actually you know, are invading the brain parenchyma. The blood-brain barrier is very complex. There's a lot of cell types involved. But it was also shown very early that you can um, sort of overcome the blood-brain barrier by injecting something into the CSF. And if you do that, so here you can see there's been an injection into the spinal cord. You can see then this dye enters the brain. It doesn't just enter the CSF, but actually gets into the brain itself. And that's because, indeed, um, CSF has free access to the brain. It's bathing the brain. It's within this barrier. And there's even evidence that it can um, go uh, you know, in between these blood vessels, and especially during sleep, uh, filters through the brain parenchyma. And that's um, also where some of the evidence for its role in clearing out aggregation-prone proteins, for example, comes from. So basically, the CSF. Um, could be another route into the brain. In fact, there are many drugs actually that are given this way uh, to override the blood-brain barrier. These are injected directly into the CSF. Now, the barrier protecting the CSF from the blood is called, of course, the blood CSF barrier. And it has to be just as selective as the blood-brain barrier, again, because the CSF has free access to the brain. And so that's why it's also part of this broader blood CNS barrier. 
but it's much simpler. So um, the endothelial cells are not involved in this barrier at all. In fact, they're highly leaky because they're fenestrated. So blood actually leaks across very easily. And so it's really only one cell type that's involved in setting up this barrier, and that is the choroid plexus epithelium. So this one cell type has to maintain a very tight barrier indeed. Okay, and so um, one of the reasons we became interested in the choroid plexus is also because we happen to see it spontaneously sometimes forming in our organoids, and you can see some of that in our earlier papers. Um, and so we figured, well, if it forms sometimes spontaneously, there must be a way to control it and for us to be able to get it, you know, more reliably and reproducibly. And so there is, uh, you know, again, we took a page from development where it is known that dorsalizing factors will promote choroid plexus or are necessary for choroid plexus formation. And there are also other um, in vitro uh, models that have shown that when you put on dorsalizing factors, BMP and wind activation, that you will get choroid plexus identities. So it makes sense if we apply the same sort of approach to our organoids, maybe we'll get not only identity, but also the proper tissue architecture, which as I say, we're so interested in getting if we get the proper tissue architecture, then maybe we'll get the proper tissue function, which hasn't been shown before. So Laura in the lab is a very talented postdoc, uh, worked out the timing, which is really key here, as well as the concentration of these small molecules, this growth factor in small molecule, and was able to generate very nicely um, quite pure choroid plexus organoids. So now these are our same sort of telencephalic organoids, um, you know, using a bit of bioengineering. Um, but now we specifically push them towards only the choroid plexus. And you can see that the morphology looks very similar to the kind of morphology that you see in vivo. She also showed that they have the proper polarity. So they um, express aquaporin um, together on this apical surface here, just like you see in an actual mouse choroid plexus. So this is actually from in vivo. And we did um, electron microscopy and showed that ultrastructurally as well, they look like a nice, uh, tight epithelial, uh, sec secretory epithelium. So they have classic characteristics of such an epithelium, lots of um, uh, microvilli, tight junctions, um, and um, these multivesicular bodies, which are, are present in highly secretory cells, as well as these extracellular vesicles. We then did, um, in order to identify what cell types are present in there, we did single cell RNA-seq and also compared with an undirected telencephalic organoid. Um, and you can see that, like I say, we get some choroid plexus already in our um, sort of undirected um, organoids, but they're primarily um, neural identities, so progenitors and neurons over here. But in our choroid plexus directed uh, organoids, we have a lot of choroid plexus identities, so these um, immature identities uh, present especially earlier on, and then more mature identities increasing over time. And you can also see that with a few of these markers. So double cortin is marking neurons, so of course you see it primarily in these telencephalic organoids. Um, whereas these markers HTR2C, CLIK6, these are more uh, mature epithelial, um, choroid plexus epithelial markers. Um, and MSX1 is a broader sort of um, patterning marker. PAX6 is marking progenitors, so it also marks progenitors of the choroid plexus. And then interestingly, we also found this cluster down here, which actually appear to be stromal cells. We were not expecting stroma, I have to say, um, but it was very exciting to see them because stromal cells are very important in choroid plexus function. And in fact, if we stain for stroma, so for example, with DLK1, you can see these nice uh, stromal compartments adjacent to the epithelium. So we also then um, compared the, these, um, the transcriptomes of these different cell types to um, in vivo transcriptomes and found that the um, <clears throat> mature choroid plexus uh, epithelium coming from our organoids um, appeared very similar to choroid plexus um, identity coming from an in vivo uh, data set. Um, and the stromal also matched very nicely an in vivo human data set. But we also included mouse here, and you can see that um, it's a better match with human than with, the, with, than with the mouse. Right, so now an interesting characteristic as, uh, as well of these organoids is that if you let them grow for a while, they will actually form these really large fluid-filled sacs. And um, if you just sort of leave one of these dishes out for a little while and let the media turn really, really pink, 
then you can see that the inside of these fluid-filled sacs is not pink. It seems to be clear. So it's not just media sort of accumulating on the inside. And so that suggested that there may be a selective barrier. So we looked at barrier markers, these tight junction components, different clodents, and saw that they were expressed. And then we actually functionally tested for a barrier by putting on differently sized uh, fluorescently tagged uh, dextrans and then uh, collecting fluid from the inside of these and um, looking by fluorescence uh, at the presence of these within and showed that they, these don't seem to be in, um, um, entering. And this is what we would expect because actually phenol red in the media is also quite small. So, um, you know, it, it should be a pretty selective barrier. Um, but to really sort of test the selectivity, we decided to look at uh, L-DOPA and dopamine. Um, we thought this would really, you know, push the system. This has not been shown, such a selectivity has, no, has to my knowledge at least, never been shown in vitro, but it's well known that in vivo, um, the, the blood CNS barrier is very selective um, and does not allow entry of dopamine, or at least only very small amounts of dopamine, whereas L-DOPA can cross just fine. So we applied these two molecules um, to the organoids and then collected fluid from the inside and sent it for NMR with a chemist uh, colleague of ours. And we're able to show that um, just like in vivo, these organoids allow L-DOPA, but not um, dopamine. And that's also quantified here. We also looked at a few other small molecules. Bupropionyl is a uh, drug that's known to cross into the brain, whereas methotrexate does not. And we see the same happening in these organoids. And we can actually take a number of different drugs and plot them on, a, on this graph where we're comparing the ratio of the drug detected. So this is from human data, the ratio of the, of the drug detected in CSF compared with plasma, you know, over plasma, versus the ratio we've got of it detected inside our organoids versus media. And when we do this, we see a really fantastic um, correlation but I think probably even more impressive about this is actually the slope. So the, the fact that the slope is essentially one tells us not only that we have a really great correlation, but that this is actually quantitatively predictive. So you know this, this is actually fitting with the amount of drug you would need to get um, in the blood in order to get it across into the CSF. So we then wanted to see um, if this is true, you know, could we also learn something about some of those drugs that I talked about that have failed so miserably in those clinical trials. And one drug in particular that failed, unfortunately, is this BIA-102474. This drug actually made headlines because it unfortunately killed somebody. In fact, this headline was before that person actually died and left five others with brain damage. And um, a, a sort of a po post-mortem on the clinical trial showed that all six of these patients that experienced brain damage were in the highest dose group, um, which is probably not surprising. But those um, same high doses or even higher doses were tested in three different preclinical animal models and were not none of this toxicity was seen. So this suggests there's a human-specific effect going on here. The other kind of strange thing was that um, symptoms in these patients appeared quite delayed after the initial dose and also lasted um, even after the blood levels were negligible. So we decided to test this drug across time. So we applied it to our organoids. We then just left it in the media. We didn't add any more, we just left it. And then we took um, samples at various time points and measured by NMR the presence of this drug within the organoid and, and looked at the ratio here. And what you see is that unlike this other drug, bupropionyl, which I showed you before, which crosses the blood-brain barrier, this one uh, is decreasing over time. But this BIA drug seems to, if anything, be potentially increasing over time. So that would suggest that it may be actually um, accumulating in the brain, and that would fit with the fact that these symptoms were appearing uh, quite delayed and even after the blood levels were negligible. And so, you know, it's, it's tempting to, to, to suggest that maybe if we'd had this model, we could have, you know, uh, you know, seen some of these as red flags and considered whether uh, going with an escalating dose group over, you know, several days is really worth it.
Um, another drug we decided to look at is, is something called Cefin-1, which is a drug that um, has entered clinical trials, but there's no data yet available. But it has some promise for treatment of neurodegeneration. And um, it has been shown um, in mice to cross into the brain. So we also tested it in our organoids, and we can also see it crossing into the, into the organoids. So we then also looked at where it lies on this curve. Now the key here, of course, is that the in vivo data is now mouse, whereas all of these other drugs is human. And when we do this, the, the, the data point is actually pretty far off this curve. So there's basically two possibilities for this. One is that maybe the organoids are not actually a good model of uh, brain entry for this drug. But another possibility is that maybe they are a good model and they are actually predicting um, a difference between human and mouse in terms of the um, kinetics, the pharmacokinetics here. And what this would suggest, if that's true, is that in humans, you might need a higher dose in order to reach the same brain concentration. So I guess we'll see when we, when we get those clinical trial data. Okay, and so now um, moving on to the, to the CSF. So like I say, we have these fluid, this fluid that looks very similar to CSF, it's clear. So we decided to actually an, um, analyze it and look to see whether you know, it could be a CSF-like fluid. And we did mass spec analysis and found a lot of overlap between the proteins we're detecting in our organoids and those found um, in vivo. So actually 49 out of the top 50 proteins are also detected in vivo. Um, and many of these are interesting biomarkers. So for example, APOE is there, um, as well as things like you know, serpent F1. Factors that are suggested to be involved or to be biomarkers for neurodegenerative conditions. We then compared with data sets, published data sets from uh, human at three different time points, one at an embryonic time point, one at a pediatric and one adult. And we saw actually overlap with all three time points. But if we separate our organoid samples, because we have lots of different organoid samples, and if we separate them into sort of two, two time ranges, earlier time points and later time points, then we actually see that the earlier time point samples have more representation of those earlier um, in vivo data, so more sort of embryonic uh, um, detected proteins, whereas <clears throat> those samples present, so those um, samples taken from um, older organoids seem to have more overlap with pediatric and even adults. And so that suggests there might be maturation of this fluid over time. So some of the factors we're seeing changing over time are um, ECM components that seem to be present early on, but not so much later. Um, Lipid-related factors, so for example, this phospholipid transfer protein, APOE, coming on and increasing over time, and complement proteins actually increasing over time as well. So with regard to the um, <clears throat> lipid uh, proteins, um, indeed, we, we can actually see lipid vesicles forming in the organoids over time, um, and this seems to be related to their, to their age. And then we could also um, combine our proteomics data with our single cell RNA-seq data and say something about which cells are actually making uh, these proteins that we're detecting in the CSF. And in particular, for example, we find IGF-2 being made mainly in the stroma, but a little bit in the epithelium. This phospholipid transfer protein we see primarily in the epithelium, and this complement protein we see a little bit in both as well. But interestingly, we don't see you know, a homogeneous uh, distribution of these factors within these clusters. And particularly within the mature choroid plexus epithelium here, we seem to see some sort of, um, well, inhomogeneous um, uh, distribution. So we started wondering if there might be um, subtypes within those mature epithelial cells. And so we took the mature epithelial cells and subclustered those. And based on their expression profile, we were able to assign four identities. One is a very small cluster of dividing cells, so that suggests there might be, um, well, a, a renewing cell population within this epithelium. We also found cells that we're calling dark and light, and this is because of some um, kind of obscure literature where it had been described in EM that you see um, cells that appear dark, um, I'll just jump to it, dark and light on EM. And this has also been seen in certain other secretory epithelial tissues. So for example, the kidney proximal tubule, 
And in that context, um, so in the choroid plexus, it's not really, it wasn't really known what these dark and light cells represent. But in the kidney uh, proximal tubule, it was suggested that um, dark cells may have more mitochondria and light cells may have more uh, cilia. And so in fact, this large cluster here shows a lot of mitochondrial genes, whereas this green cluster here shows more ciliary genes. And indeed, in our choroid plexus uh, organoids, this image I'm showing you, this EM, is actually from some of our organoids, where you can see these dark and light cells, and you can actually see a cilium coming out of this uh, light cell. Um, we also found uh, a new population that hadn't been described in choroid plexus before, which are called myoepithelial cells. And these are bona fide epithelial cells because they express classic epithelial markers, but they also express factors involved in, in constriction, so uh, myosin and actin um, cytoskeleton components. And so these have been shown in other secretory um, tissues to be involved in, you know, like for example in the breast uh, epithelium, to be involved in helping sort of squeeze out the secretions. So um, we think they, they may also be involved in helping to um, push uh, CSF production. And so we can actually then assign um, some of our um, CSF um, uh, proteins that we've identified to the actual cells that are making them. Um, and so, for example, I already mentioned circin F1 as an interesting um, biomarker, and it seems to be primarily made by these um, dark cells. And so that's kind of the, the story overall. Um, basically, by, by getting this beautiful um, tissue architecture, um, we are able to model the two key functions of the choroid plexus, the first being the barrier um, to the CSF, and the second being secretion of a human uh, CSF and, and human CSF proteins. And so um, in the last just um, couple of minutes, I want to just say what we're, you know, what we've been actually doing with those. So I probably don't need to really introduce this, the neurological manifestations. We're all aware of the concerning reports of neurological manifestations. Um, but there has been a question about, you know, whether this virus is actually infecting the brain. And so um, we decided to just take our RNA-seq data that I just showed you and actually look for the receptor and co-receptors for um, SARS-CoV-2 and see whether it was expressed. And what we found is that um, ACE2, which is the, the key receptor, seems to only be expressed in these choroid plexus clusters. So in the immature choroid plexus, the mature choroid plexus, and the choroid plexus stroma. The cofactor temporis 2 seems to be present in the immature and mature choroid plexus, so these epithelial cells. We then looked in the Allen Brain Atlas uh, database and found that ACE2, um, basically its expression matches what we're seeing in our organoids, where you see it highest in the choroid plexus. And so then we became interested in what cell types within the choroid plexus. And we wanted to just, you know, take all of these cells together because all three seem to be expressing ACE2 and then subcluster those. So before I showed you subclustering of just the mature choroid plexus, but now I'm showing you a subclustering of all of the choroid plexus cell types. And like what I just showed you before, you know, we still see um, these sort of um, subclustering into mature, immature, we can see the hem here, the, the precursor to the um, choroid plexus, the choroid plexus stroma. But what we found um, when doing this was two new, very small clusters, but two new clusters. One is clearly neural crest, but another is a cluster producing um, apolipoproteins. You can actually see that here. So you can see this cluster here is producing, for example, uh, ApoA1. And that is the cluster that seems to be expressing these, uh, this receptor and the cofactors to the highest degree. And indeed, if we look at what factors are co-expressed with ACE2, we also pull out uh, lipoprotein genes. But we also pull out other uh, virus receptors, including other receptors for coronavirus. So that suggests that there may be some, choroid, some cells within the choroid plexus that could be susceptible to this virus. So we initially tested this by using a pseudotyped lentivirus. This is a nice, safe way to do this. We could just do this in our CL1. And when we um, include a GFP, we can see which cells are being infected. So these are choroid plexus organoids, and we can see very clear infection of our organoids. 
And we also um, quantified this and compared it to a positive um, control here, a virus expressing uh, um, nonspecific uh, VSV that will just infect any cell and a virus that has no envelope glycoprotein. And we could also um, do staining for ACE2 and show that these cells seem to be expressing ACE2. Now, if we do the same thing using the same amount of virus on um, cortical, so organoids with primarily cortical identity, these are actually these air liquid interface cultures, so these slices that I just talked about, where we have really nice mature um, neurons, and as well as astrocytes, in fact, we don't see any specific infection um, compared with, for example, our, our positive control here. So this suggests that at least the choroid plexus um, susceptibility seems to be matching its expression of the receptor and seems to be much more susceptible than neurons or glia, at least in this context, obviously. We also tested this using organoids that have um, sort of a mixed identity. So these are organoids that have both cortex and choroid plexus within the same tissue. And this is a very nice sort of internal control. So we can look at them both together in the same tissue. And now we're using live virus as well, because we thought, well, what if the difference that we're seeing there is just has to do with the, the fact that it's pseudotyped? And still, we see infection of the choroid plexus here marked by HTR2C, that marker for spe that specifically marks mature choroid plexus epithelium. Um, uh, but we don't see any specific infection of the um, cortical region, the neurons and glia. We can also infect um, choroid plexus organoids with um, live virus and then look at um, the increase in the virus over time. And indeed, we see an increase as showing that this is a productive infection. And then we also stained for um, an apolipoprotein, that ApoA1 that I also showed you before on the dot plot. And you can see that the cells that seem to be infected with the virus are also those expressing these, these uh, apolipoproteins. Again, um, just you know, testing again, but now with live virus, um, but on a, a very um, pure organoid. So there's no choroid plexus here because, you know, we thought, well, what if the choroid plexus here is kind of acting as a sink and all the virus is going there, but we still don't see any specific infection. So that suggests that um, the choroid plexus is probably much more susceptible uh, than the rest of the brain, but what is actually happening? Um, you know, what happens to this tissue when this virus infects? And what we find is that um, over time, so this is four days after infection, we seem to see a breakdown of the barrier. So this Claudin-5, I showed you that before, is a nice marker of the tight junctions here. You can see them very nicely in the mock. But when we infect with the virus, the tight junctions just seem to be you know, breaking down. And in fact, we see a functional breakdown as well, where um, so it's a little bit tricky to, to functionally test the barrier with these experiments with live virus because so the kinds of dextran assays that I showed you before or even the small molecule assays require us to um, poke the insides of these organoids and suck out the fluid and this being CL3 work we can't use any sharps at all so we can't poke them at all but what we can do at least is just look for leakage of fluid from the organoids into the media so here we've just measured the amount of fluid inside and the amount of fluid outside. And you can see um, some of these organoids have completely deflated, basically all the fluid has leaked out. And then here we're measuring the protein concentration in the media because um, media is much, more pro is, is much more protein rich than CSF is. So if CSF leaks out, the protein in the media will become more dilute. And that's indeed what we see. And so basically overall, the conclusion here from this work is that um, if the virus um, gets into the blood, and that's a huge if, that's a really big if, <laughs> but if it gets into the blood, then um, it would have pretty easy access to the choroid plexus. These, like I say, these cells, these endothelial cells are highly fenestrated, very leaky. The blood and all the components within are just leaking across. And so the choroid plexus um, would become, would be very susceptible. I've shown that these cells um, are indeed susceptible and that they are that their tight junctions begin to break down. And this would lead to a breakdown of this barrier and a leakage into the CSF. Now, in terms of what that means for the patients, you know, I can only speculate, but um, 
our hypothesis is that, or at least our data would suggest that the virus itself probably isn't too much of a concern here because it doesn't seem to be infecting neurons very much. Or maybe you need to have a very high amount of virus, which might not be physiological. But what I'd probably be more concerned about is the leakage of many um, you know, neuroinflammatory molecules and immune cells that really should not be getting into the brain. I mean, this is one of the big reasons why we have a blood CNS barrier. So a breakdown of that barrier and a leakage of those factors into the CSF um, could have very negative con consequences and could lead to neural in neuroinflammation, which actually has quite a bit of overlap with the neurological symptoms that those patients are showing. So with that, I'll just um, thank the key people. I think I highlighted Lara. She was really the star of most of the work I showed you. She's a phenomenal postdoc. She is on the job market as well, uh, looking for independent group leader positions. So keep an eye out for her. Um, Stefano, I mentioned his work as well. He's a fantastic PhD student who has now gone on to, to a postdoc. And then Magda, our lab manager, has contributed to all of the projects that I showed you. I also want to thank my collaborators. Um, Leo and Anna were involved um, extensively with the uh, viral work that I showed you, as well as Claudia, the, the chemist, who helped us with all of this NMR work, um, and my funders. And uh, I'm ready to take questions. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Madeline. That was terrific. The first question is actually not a scientific question, but I, I, I'm going to start with it anyway, because I think in addition to uh, your scientific accomplishments, you've become a role model for other young scientists. And the first question actually is, do you have any advice for young girls who want to get into neuroscience? Um, yeah, so, well, I've got tons of advice, but probably, <laughs> I mean, I guess I sort of, I sort of think about what would I have liked to have maybe been told or something at some point in my, or maybe what did somebody tell me that really helped me? I think, first of all, I recognize that I definitely have, um, an advantage. I actually grew up with my father as a scientist and as a role model, he is a professor and um, having him um, as a role model really um, helped me see that, you know, scientists are just people and um, anybody can be a scientist. And I think that that really helps. And so finding a role model like that and um, having a personal, you know, getting to know somebody personally, I think is really, is really helpful. And I think if we, as scientists, can get more involved um, with talking with kids and, you know, outreach, and I've been I, I've been doing more and more of this, you know, um, talking to schools and getting you, you've got to get involved with kids at a young age, I think. So I think that kind of bridging that, making it closer to home and easier to access, I think, is is really key. Great. Now we'll move on to more, some more scientific sure. questions, though. I'm sure lots of people will reach out to you for career advice, too, life advice. Is the, uh, the next question is, uh, does the cytoarchitecture or transcriptome uh, in your organoids, is that in any way affected by uh, the starting material for the iPSCs that you've generated? Right. So kind of the cell line effect is what we're getting at here. Yeah. I mean, this is a this is a, um, a problem or I'm not sure if I would even call it a problem an, an interesting aspect that I would like to learn more about, but um, that affects all of stem cell biology, I think. I mean, we all know that there are sort of cell lines that certain people like. So people interested in, in heart development have their favorite cell lines and we in brain development have our sort of favorite cell lines and you know brain organoids um suffers from this to the same degree that cortical you know rosettes for example suffer from it as well so there is definitely an effect of the starting cell line and whether it is already biased or primed maybe to generate neural identity and understanding that better would uh, not only help us, um, you know, have, you know, increase reliability of these protocols and be able to use them across, you know, any patient cell line you might just, you, you might get, 
But also, I think it's just an interesting question how these cells are actually primed for these different identities. And that is something that is still a really big uh, a focus area of, of many labs. I've been a little bit involved in this. There's a paper that we just that I'm a co-author on that was just published in Nature Genetics, looking at some of the pathways that seem to be uh, differentially expressed or on, you know, in stem cells that are more sort of prone to neural uh, differentiation. And so, yes, that does definitely play a role. Okay. The next question is, um, do, do you see these fluid-filled sacs in all of your organoids? And I guess, it, do, do you specifically have to uh, uh, differentiate down a particular lineage, or do they emerge spontaneously? And if so, what, what do you think causes that? Yeah, so we, <clears throat> we see them in our choroid plexus organoids quite reliably. They're not always the same size, so that's kind of the only, the only issue, but they're, they're pretty much always there in the choroid plexus organoids. We see them sometimes in our organoids that we're not even directing towards that identity. That's a little trickier, though, because sometimes you get these fluid-filled cysts that aren't actually choroid plexus and aren't actually CSF. Um, they can sometimes form if you're not getting actually very pure neural identity because there's a lot of other secretory cells, obviously, that the embryo makes during development. And so sometimes you also see them in, in organoids that are not the proper identity. So it's very, it's very tricky in the undirected organoids to necessarily know. Um, but the way we kind of tell is by when they come up, when they appear. So if they appear very early, it's usually a sign that you've got a problem and they're not really differentiating the, down the right path. But these choroid plexus ones, these, these CSF filled sacs, these come on quite late. So several weeks uh, down the line. Okay, I'm going to combine the next two questions because they, they both um, deal with neurologic symptomatology that may emerge after COVID-19 uh, disease, maybe even uh, leading to what we call the long hauler syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the questions is, do you think that this breakdown of the blood-brain barrier and this influx, theoretical influx of inflammatory cytokines could be the reason why you have persistent neurologic symptoms and long haulers? And do you think also that this can account for some of the loss of smell, which is some of the initial symptomatology and, and persistent symptomatology? Mm -hmm. I think, um, I mean, of course, this is just hand waving and I don't have any data, but there is a lot of overlap between the long haulers and you know, chronic fatigue syndrome uh, slash ME, where um, you know, you, many, in many of those cases, there's actually a viral infection that triggers it. Sometimes the person doesn't even know they had a viral infection, but there are quite a few where it's very clear that there's this post-viral um, chronic fatigue syndrome and encephalopathy. And so um, I think um, the overlap with that is quite striking, actually, and and you know some of these long haulers are describing some of the same kinds of symptoms, really strong fatigue, you know headaches, um, brain fog, you know this kind of thing, and um, in those in chronic fatigue syndrome, there's still a lot that we don't know, and I think it's partly the fault of the medical establishment kind of ignoring it or thinking it's all in their head. But there is some data that suggests that there may be a chronic neuroinflammation going on there. And what's very interesting is actually that the choroid plexus is expressing a lot of receptors for various viruses, not just, not just the virus causing COVID, but things like you know, hepatitis virus. And actually something like 40% of hepatitis uh, patients experience neurological symptoms. And so I'm, it sort of gets me wondering if maybe the choroid plexus might be a more general kind of weak point um, into the brain. And the fact that the blood CSF barrier is so simple, it's really only one cell type to get past. So it's, it's, I, I think it may be a weak point in the brain. And I think it's worth investigating, not just in terms of COVID, but in, in a more general kind of uh, sense. In terms of um, uh, loss of sense of smell and taste, Honestly, I actually, I really have no idea. Um, I think it's it's hard to know. It could be the olfactory epithelium itself that's taking, you know, or the supportive cells there, because of course they, there are um, receptors in the supportive cells there. But um, we don't have olfactory neurons in our organoids. So it could also be that specifically the olfactory neurons are actually dying, but we can't see that in our organoids. Okay. 
Okay. The next question probably gets at asking you to elaborate more on the variability that you can see from organoid to organoid. And the questioner wants to know, can, can the variability be so great that you can actually see some regions present in some organoids and not in others? And do you see, based on the regions you see, can you see differences in innervation? Or do you see innervation? Yeah, so I have to say, so, so basically between organoids within a batch, we actually don't see very much variability in, in the sense of, so for example, you can have a batch that primarily generates cortex, and you'll notice that all of the organoids primarily generate cortex. You can have another batch where they seem to be quite mixed, and part of the organoid will be cortex, and part of it will be choroid plexus, and part of it will be you know, gang-like eminence, and you'll see that same kind of mixture in the other organoids from the same batch. So this our experience is at least that the batch variability, so the, the biggest source of variability is cell line to cell line. The next source of variability is batch to batch. And then only down at the bottom is kind of organoid to organoid. And so um, it's you have to, this is why we've also been trying to, to um, get a better reliability of just forming telencephalon so that we don't have, you know, midbrain or hindbrain in there. And that's working really, really well now. We have very nice reproducible formation of telencephalon. But there are some cell lines that are just, you know, stubborn and won't do it. You know, it's a, it's a common theme throughout cell biology for generations. So it's, yeah. um, the next question, I wanted you to elaborate a little bit more as to the feasibility of using the organoids for drug discovery, particularly for neuropathology. Yeah, so my view, and I, I probably should have made this a little bit clearer because I introduced the idea of, you know, the, 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 the failure in the drug pipeline. I think that um, organoids really, there, it depends on what you're using and which sort of organoid method and kind of, you know, which approach you're using. The organoids that I talked about today, the sort of um, intrinsically developing organoids are... Um, very powerful as a, the way I kind of view them is like uh, as close to human in vivo as we can get. And so just like um, with other in vivo models, so the mouse, for example, you don't do drug screening in mice, but you do use mice to test drugs that you already have from other drug screening experiments, you know, to test a, a, a very small panel of drugs and see what effects they have. And that's where I think organoids, these organoids at least, will be most powerful is to be used in that way. But of course, they're human. So that's really their strength. Um, more defined organoids or even probably, you know, 2D cultures where you really have a much a more simpler kind of um, architecture or maybe even no architecture at all, but much more defined um, cellular makeup. Those are, are more um, appropriate, I think, for drug screening. Um, I don't think these organoids that I showed you are really right for high throughput screening. But maybe, like I say, as, a, as an alternative or a, or a complementary uh, approach to the mouse work that is already being done, but again, human. Okay, and I think maybe we'll make this the last question. It's a more uh, technical question. And... Uh, as, as the field is maturing and one recognizes that a lot of the organoids depend on matrigel and basal membrane extracts, the questioner wants to know, is the field moving increasingly towards uh, chemically defined and xeno-free modeling systems? Mm -hmm. I do think that having a, a more defined um, culture system is good for many reasons. So for the maybe simpler approaches where you would want to scale up and do um, drug screening, you definitely need a very nice defined, it needs to be very reliable to do something like drug screening. Um, you also need to have it, you know, xeno-free if you ever want to establish something for, for example, cell replacement therapies, you know, regenerative medicine. But I also think just, just so that we can have a, a real good handle on, um, on all of the variables and all the factors that are influencing these organoids, um, having a really defined uh, media and formulation is important. And one thing we have been playing around with is different formulations, uh, alternatives to matrigel.
Um, and so, for example, we've we've been able to see that just using laminin and dentactin, just those two components, is actually enough to get the same effects that Matrigel provides. You know, just as I said, that's the last question. Of three came in, so I may quickly sure. pepper that's you fine. with these last three, and then we then we will sure. call it quits. Okay. Do you see? Uh, uh, neurons of various neurotransmitter types in your organoids. Yeah, so on the single cell RNA seq, for example, we've also done some staining for different um, different um, neurotransmitters, um, and yeah, we do. So uh, again, it sort of depends on um, how much of the different regions within the telencephalon. So if you have really only dorsal identities, uh, then you you won't really get inhibitory neurons. But if you have those ganglionic eminences in there, along with cortex, then you'll see very nicely, you know, GABAergic neurons, as well as glutamatergic neurons. We've even seen neurons that seem to be noradrenergic as well. Um, and so, and even, you know, of course, if you've put, if you've got a little bit of posteriorization and a bit of midbrain identity, you'll see dopaminergic neurons. So yes, I, you do get those neurons. It just depends on just like with development, you know, it depends on whether you have the precursor tissue that gives rise to those different neuron types. And then I guess a follow-up to that is, given that you see these neurotransmitters, is there innervation between region to region within the organoids, or is it simply random connections, or do they seem to be physiological in any way, or do you know that yet? Yeah, so we've only really, we've really only looked at this long-term sort of innervation in our more, let's say, pure sort of cortical um, organoids. Um, I mean, they, they do actually have um, inhibitory interneurons as well, but they're still, you know, cortical. So we don't really have th thalamus in there. And we don't, you know, we don't have spinal cord unless we introduce it like I showed you. So um, the, the innervation that we're getting is, is intracortical, but we do see that really beautifully. We see these tracts projecting inside almost almost like white matter within the brain projecting from one side to the other. And we can even stain for specific markers, like there's a, a specific marker for the corpus callosum and you can see specific tracts within staining positive for that, um, that marker. Okay, so now we will end with a theoretical question. Um, do, do you foresee as the use of organoids increases, do you see the use of animal studies decreasing? That's a tough one because I, I don't think, yeah, I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we're there. I mean, I, I do, I, I would like to have an impact there. I think animal research will always be necessary. I mean, an organoid at the end of the day, it's a floating ball of brain tissue. Uh, it's not in an organism and in a, and a brain is just not functional if it's not in a body. So um, I do, I think, and there's all this, you know, this, this interaction between the brain and the rest of the body, the, 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 the microglia, for example, that are not produced within the brain that have to come from outside, you know, the vasculature, the, the, the gut brain axis, for example. So there are so many questions that we, we can't answer in organoids and we can try to sort of approach those. And, but I think we'll always need some in vivo animal models to confirm some of the hypotheses, but Organoids, I think, might give us um, a way to test lots and lots of different ideas fairly quickly without having to go through lots of animals. And then you sort of move to the animal for the final experiments, hopefully, and maybe, you know, refine our use of animals. Okay, great answer. And with that, we will let you go. And thank you for having thank shared you. your evening with us. Yes, thank you so much. It was wonderful.